any other soil than Mahayana Buddhism. In Japan this school has achieved a unique development marking a spiritual epoch in the history of religious faith in the East. The Parinirvana Sutra This once formed the foundation of the Nirvana school in the early history of Chinese Buddhism. Its main assertion is that the Buddha nature is present in every one of us. Before the arrival of this sutra in China it was generally believed that there was a class of people known as Ikanti who had no Buddha nature in them and therefore who were eternally barred from attaining enlightenment. This belief was entirely expelled, however, when a statement to the contrary was found in the sutra, saying that there is something in all beings which is true, real, eternal, self-governing, and forever unchanging this is called ego, though quite different from what is generally known as such by the philosophers. This ego is the Tathagatagarbha, Buddha nature, which exists in every one of us, and is characterized with such virtues as permanency, bliss, freedom, and purity. 9. All these and other sutras of Mahayana Buddhism may seem to exhaust the many-sided aspects of this school. But another is needed to tell us that mere understanding is not enough in the Buddhist life, that without self-realization all intellection amounts to nothing. To tell us this is the office of the Lankavatara Sutra, and Bodhidharma, father of Zen Buddhism, made use of the text quite effectively. For it was through him that a special school of Buddhism under the title of Zen or Chen has come to develop in China and in Japan. While Zen as we have it now is not the same in many respects as Bodhidharma first proclaimed it about 15 centuries ago, the spirit itself flows quite unchanged in the East. And this is eloquently embodied in the Lankavatara Sutra. It is not, however, necessary here for us to enter into details, for the point has been fully dwelt upon in my recent work, Studies in the Lankavatara Sutra. Suffice it to touch lightly upon the characteristic features of the Sutra which constitute its special message as distinguished from the other sutras already referred to. There is no doubt that the Lanka is closely connected in time as well as in doctrine with the awakening of faith in the Mahayana generally ascribed to Asvatosha. While he may not have been the author of this most important treatise of Mahayana philosophy, there was surely a great Buddhist mind, who, inspired by the same spirit which pervades the Lanka, the Avatamsaka, the Parinirvana, etc., poured out his thoughts in the awakening. Some scholars contend that the awakening is a Chinese work, but this is not well grounded. In a way the awakening is an attempt to systematize the Lanka, for all the principal teachings of the latter are found there developed in due order. As far as the theoretical side is concerned, both teach the existence of the Garba as ultimate reality. While this lies in ordinary people defiled by the evil passions and does not shine out in its native purity, we cannot deny its existence in them. When the external wrappage of impurities is peeled off we all become Buddhas and Tathagatas. In fact, the birth of a Tathagata is nowhere else than in this Garbha. The Garbha is from the psychological point of view the Alayavihnana. All conserving mind, in which good and bad are mingled, and the work of the Yogin, that is, one who seeks the truth by means of self-discipline, is to separate the one from the other. Why is the Alaya found contaminated by evil thoughts and desires? What is the evil? How does it come out in this world? How is the truth to be realized? These questions are answered by postulating a system of Vijnanas and by the doctrine of discrimination, as has already been expounded above. This is the point where the Lanka comes in contact with the Yogacara school. The Yogacara is essentially psychological standing in contrast in this respect to the Madhyamaka school which is epistemological. But the Alayavihnana of the Yogacara is not the same as that of Lanka and the awakening of faith. The former conceives the Alaya to be purity itself with nothing defiled in it whereas the Lanka and the awakening make it the cause of purity and defilement. Further, the Yogacara upholds the theory of Vijnaptimatra and not that of Siddhamatra which belongs to the Lanka, Avatamsaka, and awakening of faith. The difference is this. According to the Vijnaptimatra, the world is nothing but ideas, there are no realities behind them. But the Siddhamatra states that there is nothing but Siddha, mind, in the world and that the world is the objectification of mind. The one is pure idealism and the other idealistic realism. To realize the Siddhamatra is the object of the Lanka, 
and this is done when discrimination is discarded, that is, when a state of non-discrimination is attained in one's spiritual life. Discrimination is a logical term and belongs to the intellect. Thus we see that the end of the religious discipline is to go beyond intellectualism, for to discriminate, to divide, is the function of the intellect. Logic does not lead one to self-realization. Hence Nagarjuna's hair-splitting dialectics. His idea is to prove the ineffectiveness of logic in the domain of our spiritual life. This is where the Lanka joins hands with the Madhyamaka. The doctrine of the void is indeed the foundation of Mahayana philosophy. But this is not to be understood in the manner of analytical reasoning. The Lanka is quite explicit and not to be mistaken in this respect. So far, the Lanka may seem to be only a philosophical treatise with nothing religious in it, but the fact is that the sutra is deeply tinged with religious sentiments. For instance, the Bodhisattva would not enter into Nirvana because of his vows to save all sentient beings, and his vows are not limited in time and space, and for this reason they are called inexhaustible. Not only are his vows inexhaustible but the skillful means he uses for the emancipation of all beings know no limits. He knows how to make the best use of his inexhaustible resources intellectual and practical for this single purpose. Here we may say that the Bodhisattva Samantabhadra of the Avatamsaka or the Gandhavyaha is reflected. In the Lanka all the most fundamental conceptions of the Mahayana are thrown in without any attempt on the part of the compiler or compilers to give them a system. This is left to the thoughtful reader himself who will pick them up from the medley and string them into a garland of pearls out of his own religious experience. The one significant Mahayana thought, however, which is not expressly touched upon in the sutra is that of Parinamana. Parinamana means to turn one's merit over to somebody else so as to expedite the latter's attainment of nirvana. If anybody does anything good, its merit is sure to come back to the doer himself this is the doctrine of karma. But according to the Mahayana the recipient need not always be the doer himself, he may be anybody, he may be the whole world. Merit being of universal character can be transferred upon anything the doer wishes. This transferability is known as the doctrine of Parinamana, the turning over of one's good work to somebody else. This idea comes from the philosophical teaching of interpenetration as upheld in the Avatamsaka. 4. The Date of the Lanka as is the case with other Buddhist texts it is quite impossible with our present knowledge of Indian history to decide the age of the Lanka. The one thing that is certain is that it was compiled before 443 A.D. When the first Chinese translation is reported to have been attempted. But this does not mean that the whole text as we have it now was then already in existence. For we know that the later translations done in 513 and 700 to 704 contain the Dharni and the Sagathakam section which are missing in the 443 one. Further, the meat-eating chapter also suffered certain modifications, especially in the 513 one. Even with the text that was in existence before 443 a. d. We do not know how it developed for it was not surely written from the beginning as one complete piece of work as we write a book in these modern days. Some parts of it must be older than others, since there is no doubt that it has many layers of added passages. To a certain extent, the contents may give a clue to the age of the text. But because of the difficulty of separating one part from another from the point of view of textual criticism, arguments from the contents as to the date are of very doubtful character. As long as we have practically no knowledge of historical circumstances in which the Buddhist texts were produced one after another in India or somewhere else, all the statements are more or less of the character of an ingenious surmise. All that we can say is this that the Lanka is not a discourse directly given by the founder of Buddhism. That it is a later composition than the Nikayas or Agamas which also developed some time after the Buddha. That when Mahayana thoughts began to crystallize in the northern as well as in the southern part of India probably about the Christian era or even earlier. The compiler or compilers began to collect passages as he or they came across in their study of the Mahayana. Which finally resulted in the Buddhist text now known under the title of Lankavatara Sutra. Some remarks concerning the text. Certain irregularities of the chapter endings are to be noticed in this connection. 
generally these endings show that the chapters are composite parts of a sutra and belong to it. But in the case of the Lunka some endings are quite of an independent character, and their relation to the text is not at all definite. For instance, Chapter 1 Chapter 1 known as Ravana Invitation Chapter 2 Here ends Chapter 2 known as the collection of all the dharmas in the 36, 000 Lankavatara. Chapter 3 Here ends Chapter 3 on impermanency in the Lankavatara, a Mahayana Sutra. Chapter 5 Here ends Chapter 4 on realization. Chapter 5 Here ends Chapter 5 on the permanency and impermanency of the Tathagata. Chapter 6 Here ends Chapter 6 on momentariness. Chapter 7 Here ends Chapter 7 on egolessness. Chapter 8 Here ends Chapter 8 on meat eating from the Lankavatara, which is the essence of all the Buddha teachings. Chapter 9 Here ends Chapter 9 known as Dharni in the Lankavatara. These irregularities, at least in one case, show that there was a larger Lanka containing 36. 000 slukas 1 as referred to in Fatsung's notices 2 and in another case that the Lanka was also known, or contained, a chapter known as the essence of all the Buddha teachings which is indeed a sort of subtitle given to the four-volume Chinese Lanka by Gunabhadra, 443. A. D. The Gatha section called Sagathakam presents peculiar difficulties. As the earliest Chinese translation by Gunabhadra does not contain it, it is highly probable that it was not then included in the Lanka text. But the fact that both the Way version and the Sanskrit edition contain not only the verses properly belonging to the Sagathakam but those one already appearing in the prose section. Hints at the existence of a larger or more complete text of the Lanka in which all these Sagathakam verses were incorporated in the prose section. Which, therefore, must have been naturally much fuller than the existing Lanka perhaps something like the one containing 36, 000 slukas. There are many verses in the Sagathakam which are too obscure to be intelligently interpreted without their corresponding prose passages. The verses are generally meant for memorizing the principal doctrines. And they give sometimes no sense when they are separately considered, for some watchwords only are rhythmically arranged to facilitate the memory. In the Sanskrit text, the Sagathakam begins with this stanza. Listen to the wonderful Mahayana doctrine. Declared in this Lankavatara Sutra. Composed in verse gems. And destroying a net of the philosophical views. This may be understood to mean that this section is that part of the Lanka which is made up with the verses, that is to say, the verses taken from the entire text of the Lanka. The term Sagathakam also suggests this for it means the one with verses. But in this case the following questions may be asked. If there were a larger lanka containing all these verses in the Sagathakam in the body of the text, or if there were a lanka with the verses alone and as a separate text which was later on put together with the present one, are all these verses as a whole to be regarded as belonging to the same period? If so, what caused the disappearance of the prose passages which accompanied the verses now retained in the Sagathakam only? Is there no possibility of some of the verses added later to the text independently? There is some evidence of such additions as we can see, for instance, in the conception of the Samagakaya and of the Ninth Vijnana, which are surely of later development. The solution of these and some other possible questions is to be left to some future time when all the circumstances leading to the production of the Buddhist sutras Mahayana and Hinayana in various districts of India are ascertained. The best way of reading the Lanka, as I said in my studies, is to cut the whole text into as many pieces one as the sense allows and to regard each piece as completely expressing one chief thought in the philosophy of Mahayana Buddhism. In some cases the pieces so severed may seem to conflict with one another. In such cases a higher principle will be found somewhere else that unifies the two contradictory notions harmoniously. For after all there is but one highest truth in the Lanka, of which all others are so many aspects viewed at various angles of thought. I thought I would treat the Sagathakam in a similar manner, by dividing the whole portion into so many groups of verses each of which is presumably concerned with one theme. But the verses being too concise and often merely mnemonic, 
one finds it too risky to cut them up into groups and to take the latter as containing so many definite sets of thoughts. As we notice in the cases of repetition occurring so frequently in the Sagathakam the verses are not solidly transferred from the text. That is, they are not always found in the Sagathakam in the same order as they are in the text proper, nor are they complete. Sometimes one single verse is taken out of the group where it belongs in the main text and inserted in an unexpected connection. In these circumstances I thought it wise to leave the Sagathakam as it stands and not to arrange the verses into groups until we know more exactly about the historical evolution of this portion of the Lunka. One this cutting is indicated in the following translation by the Roman figures running consecutively through the entire text except the Ravana, the Dharni, and the meat-eating chapter, where no such dividing is necessary. In fact, the Sagathakam is a curious mixture where subjects not at all referred to in the prose section are in juxtaposition with those that have to my view no proper bearing in the Lunka. Such subjects are those historical narratives concerning Vyasa, Katyayana, Nagavaya, etc. And those relating to the monastery life. And then there are some passages in the Sagathakam which may be regarded as later additions. For instance, when it refers to eight or nine several Vijnanas, two forms of Alaya, the triple body, thirty-six Buddhas, etc. They are evidently later incorporations. The Sagathakam requires more study from the point of text criticism, and also from the point of doctrinal, literary and monarchical history. The Transmission History of the Lunka the Transmission History of the Lunka The Transmission History of the Lunka In the book called, Record of Master and Disciple in the Transmission of the Lunka, which is one of the Tunghuang findings, the transmission line of the Lunka is recorded. The author, Ching Chue, living probably early in the 8th century apparently identified Zen Buddhism with the teaching of the Lunka, for his fathers of the Lunka transmission are also those of Zen Buddhism. He considers Gunabhadra, the translator of the Sung or four-volume Lanka, the first father of Zen in China, and not Bodhidharma as is generally done by Zen historians. In this the author may be in the right. For in his day there was yet no independent school which later came to be known as Zen, and whatever represented this movement at the time was no more than the study of the Lanka. Moreover, Qingche Ue belonged to the school of Xuanze and Shenzi who upheld the Lanka in opposition to their rival Huaineng's Vage Rakadika. This book is one of the most valuable documents for the historical students of early Zen Buddhism in China One, it contains so much information of definite character concerning its fathers whose sayings and teachings have so far been shrouded in obscurity. There is another equally valuable history of Zen Buddhism which was also discovered in the Tunghuang Cave. It is entitled Record of the Succession of the Dharma Treasure. This was evidently written to contend the position of the For it insists that the first father of the Lanka as representing the Dharma Treasure was Bodhidharma and not Gunabhadra who was mere translator and not the revealer of the inner meaning of the Sutra. Therefore, the history of Zen Buddhism in China, which is the Dharma Treasure, should properly begin with Bodhidharma. The author evidently belongs to the school of Huaineng. The discovery of these two important historical works on Zen, together with the sayings of Shen Hui, which was edited by Professor Hu Shi of Peking University, 1930, with his able critical notes, sheds an abundance of light on the early pages of Zen history in China. As a detailed discussion of the subject does not belong here, I reserve it for my Essays in Zen Buddhism, Series 2. The Present English Translation the present English translation. The present English translation. As regards the English translation of the Sutra, I have decided after much hesitation to send it out to the public with all its many imperfections. It is a bold attempt on the part of the translator to try to render some of the deepest thoughts that have been nourished in the East into a language to which he was not born. But his idea is that if somebody did not make a first attempt, however poor and defective, the precious stones may remain buried unknown except to a few scholars, and this perhaps longer than necessary. And then things develop. As it is illustrated in the long history of the Chinese translations of the Buddhist texts, there must be several attempts before the work assumes something of finality. 
There are at present three Chinese translations and one Tibetan of the Lanka, and the first shows many traces of immaturity when compared with the third. We can easily understand the difficulties Chinese scholars encountered in trying to master the translations. The Tiang version could not perhaps be so perfect as it is unless it had two or three predecessors. One the book has been quite recently edited by Qin Qiqiai, a librarian attached to Peking University and published in Peking. He was able to do this helped by Professor Hu Shi, who is the owner of the photographic copies of the original manuscripts of preserved in the British Museum and in the Bibliath 1K Nationale. A collotype impression of the London MS which is not so complete as the Paris MS. Though it is very much more legible than the latter, was published by Professor Keiki Yabuki of Japan, in his collection of the Tunhuang MSS, entitled, Echoes of the Desert, 1930. I have done all I could to make my translation as intelligible as possible to my readers. If I tried to be too literal, it would be quite unintelligible. The modes of expression are so different in the Sanskrit. There are still many obscure passages which I failed to interpret satisfactorily to myself. These obscurities are found more in the Sagathakam. Because the verses presuppose much knowledge of the matter treated therein. And this knowledge involves at present much more scholarship and intellectual perspicuity than the present translator can command. The Sagathakam has never had any Chinese commentaries and this fact adds more to the difficulties already in existence. Chinese and Japanese scholars have chosen, probably for brevity's sake, the four-volume text by Gunabhadra for their study, and the Sagathakam has thus inevitably been left out. The Sanskrit text itself as we have it is still far from being perfect, and there is no doubt that Nanjo's edition requires many corrections in order to yield a more intelligible reading. Even with it, however, Whatever shortcomings it may have, we are to be grateful to the editor who made the text more accessible to the public than ever before. I have not always followed Nanjo in the reading of the text. I have used my own judgment in several cases when I thought the sense became thereby clearer. In paragraphing too I have often disregarded Nanjo. As I said in my studies, the Lanka is a highly chaotic text, and there are also some passages which have forced their way in wrong places where they do not belong. The Tiang version in this respect gives on the whole the best rendering of the Lanka. While a first draft of the translation was prepared by Sikh Shananda. The finishing touch was given by Fat Sung, the great teacher of philosophy of the Avatamsaka, with which the Lanka is in the closest relationship. When difficulties were encountered in the course of my English translation of the Sanskrit text, I have quite frequently followed the Tiang reading, though the fact has not regularly been noted. A special index to the sutra is being prepared and will be issued before long as a separate volume. Chapter 1 1 1 OM Salutation to the Triple Treasure Salutation to all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas here is carefully written down the Lankavatara Sutra in which the Lord of the Dharma discourses on the egolessness of all things. Thus have I heard. The Blessed One once stayed in the castle of Lanka which is situated on the peak of Mount Malaya on the Great Ocean. And which is adorned with flowers made of jewels of various kinds. Point two, he was with a large assembly of pictures and with a great multitude of bodhisattvas. Who had come together from various Buddha lands. The Bodhisattva Mahasattvas, 